All right. So today we're going to look at organizations for speeches. We're going to first start with the basics, uh, introductions and conclusions. Now, I remember my first course in communication at, uh, at one of my colleges, or the first college I went to, I only went to two colleges, uh, and I was a speech major. So my major was communication speech. And uh, I was really upset because I had to take a class in public speaking. And I was like, this is ridiculous. Like, I just came off of four years of high school competitive debate. Like, I'm going to teach this class in high school. Like, you don't need to teach me anything, lady. I know what I'm doing here. And on the first day of school, she has a picture of a hamburger. Okay, and she says, well, what is this? They're like, oh, that's a hamburger. And she goes, no, it actually represents a speech. If you look at it and think about it, it kind of makes sense, right? You've got uh, two pieces of bread. If I call them something different, some of y'all will giggle. Okay? Uh, I'll let you giggle in your own mind. Uh, and then you have the, the, the patty, the meat of the whole thing, which would be uh, the body. And then you have all these things like pickles and lettuce and tomatoes. Those are the embellishments. Those are what makes the burger taste better, right? So those are the things you do in your speech that makes it pop. Okay? And we'll talk about all these things, but you want to know the basics. Introduction, body, conclusion. I can take it in any English class. Hey, if you were in the fourth grade and you learned how to write for the first time, you know what this is. Okay? But remember this idea of the hamburger, okay? Because we're going to talk about why it's so important to think of speeches like a hamburger later on in the speech. Because oftentimes students don't make this connection and they don't do very well in their first speech because they didn't think of it this way and their whole speech falls apart. And I'll explain why later. All right. So here is, a, here is an introduction from a speech. Uh, I want you to imagine the scene. It's a damp morning during the Christmas season in London. The city awakes to see streets with a thick gray mist. But this is no ordinary London fog. As clouds roll through the streets and seep into houses, uh, men, women, and children are gasping for breath. Within hours, emergency hospital emergency rooms are cramped people complaining of seeing lungs. When the fog finally lifts five days later, thousands are dead. Okay? What is unique about this introduction? It's shocking. It's shocking. Absolutely. When you hear this, you're like, well, what is this? What fog oh, killed all these thousand people? You want to know more naturally. This is what makes this a good introduction. Something that grabs your attention instantly, okay? And wants you, makes you want to know more, okay? So this leads us to what is important. Introductions serve three purposes. First is to gain attention, okay? I will always say this because it's so important, okay? You have three seconds. Three seconds to get my and your audience's attention. Okay, there have been research that shows that really when we pay attention to something, if we're not interested in the first three seconds, we tune out. Okay, have you ever had that moment when you're flipping through the channels? You're like, no, 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 no. Same kind of idea, right? Something's got to grab your attention for you to keep it tuned into a certain state uh, to a certain channel, right? So that's why uh, it's very important, specifically for introductions, that we gain attention early. Uh, so that our audience can tune out. Then the next goal, and this is something that a lot of people have trouble with, uh, is the fact that you people are not connecting uh, their topic and their purpose of the introduction. They just think their introduction is for is for uh, you know an attention getting device. Now English teachers will tell you it's very important to have an appropriate thesis. Okay, and I'm going to tell you that it's important to have somewhat of a thesis and to tell your audience where you're going to go in your speech. What you have to assume about your audience is that they're all very dumb. Now, I'm not saying you guys are dumb. I'm just saying that you need to assume that, okay? Because if someone were to come in uh, without paying attention to your introduction, uh, but if they pay attention to the very new introduction, they would see the, um, the, uh, the topic that you would be talking about today. And that would allow them to, to figure out where you're going in the speech. The introduction should also, and this is very important, preview your main points. And I'll explain what that means in just a minute, okay? But ultimately, another thing you do in your introduction is really connect everything together and uh, preview your main points, okay? Finally, and this, you know, there's a formula for a good introduction. This doesn't really fall within said formula, okay? <coughs> okay. What you working on, Grant? Yep, that's what I thought. I'll just take ten for that one. So, um, 
there's the formula for making a good instruction doesn't really tell you to connect uh, when it comes to like, you know, this plus this plus this equals a good introduction. But we know this from prior lessons, right? That it just makes sense for you to come off as interested so that your audience sees that. And you're, you're a lot more confident if you're interested in what you're talking about. Okay. All right. So uh, I'm going to just get rid of that there. And then what we're going to do is before I show you what a good instruction looks like, I want to talk about this. Now, this is not called a purpose statement. This is called a signpost. Now, what a signpost does, it's, it's a summary. It summarizes what you're going to talk about in your speech, and it tells the main points of your speech. Think about like a sign, right? It points you in the right direction. It says 30 miles to Call of Duty, 35 miles to Brian, 50 miles to Huntsville. Okay? It tells you these things. All right? 50 miles to Huntsville. That makes sense. But whatever. It tells you where you're going. Okay, same is true with the signpost in your speech. You give your main points like uh, like you would a signpost, okay? Now, this is something that a lot of high school students tend to mistake, okay? And they tend to forget, all right? It basically states a topic and gives the main points. It looks something like this. I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to also teach you for three reasons. One, I have energy. Two, I have good ideas. And three, I relate things to real life. That's three things, okay? And you say what you're going to say in your topic. So the topic is here. Then you have your body points here, okay? That is what makes a very good signpost. You say topic and main points, all right? And I'm going to show you what that looks like in just a moment. I thought you use that formula in your voice class, and she's like, <laughs> yep, uh, because English teachers and history teachers alike usually don't like this idea. Okay, it really only works for speeches because there's two real big different things between uh, you know the written and in speaking. Right, I'm a terrible writer because I write how I speak. So if you write a speech like you would write, you'd probably put together a really wordy unnecessary kind of lengthwise speech like it didn't it wouldn't make sense for you to write a speech as you would as a writer but if you do it the other way around your english will get mad because there's not enough or they don't like the structure english just really don't like the idea of doing this right they want you just to give your thesis and move on right because i mean your, your body points are very clear like you can't what i tell my students is you can't indent in a speech does that make sense like i can't see an indentation on in a speech so the only way I know you're moving on to something new in a paper is you indent, right? Is that people still do that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So in speeches, it makes sense for you to have a clear signpost so I know your main point so I can follow along. Kind of a mental indentation. Okay. So and there's also another way to do it, and I'll talk about a walk in just a moment. There's a special speaking walk, which is more like advanced speaking, but I'll teach you anyway. Okay, and I'm going to pause right there for a minute, and I want to, so, okay, let's see here, one thing, so let's just say, for example, that I'm writing a speech about, um, um, let me just say, I'm writing a speech about um, eating healthy, okay, and I start my speech with, Want to lose 25 pounds in six weeks? That right there, you're like, yes. Okay. Become vegan. And then I would give a little more background on being vegan. And I would say, being vegan is pretty easy. Just follow these steps. Wow, my hearing is terrible. One, don't eat meat. Yep. Two, avoid dairy. Three, no eggs. And you could talk about each one of these three points in your speech. Okay. 
that's what it would be like for a DC production. Okay, attention gain device here. And then here are the main points. I used to do a speech uh, about yo-yos in here. And I used to say that, uh, I said, I never forget when I was a kid, I watched a movie with a, with a white man with a humongous blonde afro. And he had two yo-yos going all the time, and it was something that I remember most of my childhood. And I always wanted to be really good at the yo-yo. So I picked up a yo-yo instructional video and two yo-yos, and I started practicing. <coughs> Today, I'm going to share my love with the yo-yo and teach you a couple yo-yo tricks. First, I'm going to show you the sleeper. Then, I'm going to show you uh, the around the wall. And finally, we're going to put it all together and do the very famous trick, the cat's cradle. Okay. I gave a story from my life, which was an attention gain device. I talked about a crazy white guy with an afro. Okay. Uh, then I bridged it into my topic. I'm going to show you how to do some yo-yo tricks. First, sleeper. Second, around the world. Third, the cat's cradle. Okay. I told you where I was going in my speech. And then I would say, okay, first we're going to talk about the sleeper. And I would transition over to my first point. Okay. And that was the first thing I talked about in my points. When I list them off was first I'm going to talk about the sleeper. First, I'm going to talk to you about the sleeper, and I moved over and said it, okay? You want to make sure that you're doing one, two, three, sleeper, around, cats, okay? If this is the end of your introduction, right? The next thing that should follow should be your first point, which you said right there. Does that make sense? Folks, this is like the easiest way to lose points on a speech by not doing this. It's like one of my biggest pet peeves and students forget it. So I want to like hammer that in. That's not hard. Just list your main points and then speak about those main points in order. So then my second main point after I'm going to talk about a sleeper, I'm going to talk about around the world. Right? And then finally I'm going to talk about the cat's cradle. Right? I used to do that speech. I may do that speech this year. It's a fun speech to do. I used to knock off straws out of students' mouths. So I'd have them put a straw in their mouth and I'd knock it off with my yo-yo like this. <laughs> I only hit a student once. <laughs> I just tapped their nose. It was okay. They 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 they, uh, they moved forward because like you know they had the straw in their mouth like this, and they moved forward, and I told them stay still. And when they move forward, it whacked their nose because they moved forward. I was like, that's your fault. You moved. So, anyways, so that's, uh, that's what that would look like, okay? Now, let's go back. I'm going to show you now some very popular introductions. What I'm telling you is these are not the end-all, be-all, okay? There are different ways you can grab an audience's attention. And however you want to do it, if, if it grabs attention, fine. These are just kind of textbook examples. So you don't have to like use these if you have a better way of doing it. These are just some, just some suggested ways, okay? And there's seven of them. Okay, a startling statement. So that's what you saw at the beginning of, of, the, uh, of the presentation. It could be a startling statement or a statistic. 85% of minority students who practice, who, who Compete in debate, go to uh, college. True statement. Which is why urban debate leagues are rising in like Houston, Dallas, uh, and all over the United States. That's a startling statistic. 85% of minority students, okay, who compete in debate will go to college. That is amazing. Okay? That's a startling statistic. Uh, now you've got a statistic that says one in four children will be born with this. That's a sewing statistic, right? Right here, this says if you start with $2,000 a year saving in an individual retirement account by age, at 18, by the age of 65 when you retire, you'll have $2 million waiting for you. Literally, that's true. $2 million. $200 a year. I'm sorry, $2,000. $2,000 a year. Which is really two, roughly around $200 a month. A little less than that, I guess. Okay, that's why granny's rolling up with new cars all the time. Just saving money. I've always wondered, it's like, why is my grandma always getting new cars? She saved a bunch of money. When I first got a job in the business community, they said, 
oh, well, you're a young guy. You're a young guy. You got to save money now. And then when you retire, you're going to have a bunch of money. And that's the truth. Okay? Um, you're likely to have in the millions when you retire if you do this consistently. Okay, which is why it's really important. My everyone's saying is start young, start saving for retirement. That's a startling statement, startling statistic. Okay. You can start with those. Those are cool. Those are very popular. Easy to do. Okay. I don't know if I do that. That's not just blowing all of the months. Well, $2 million by the time you retire may not be that much. All right. That's Martin Luther King, by the way. Everyone thinks that's someone different every year. It's like, why do you got kale and peel or whatever? Keel and peel? Keel and peel? Keel, keel? Key? And Mr. Benson? Peel. Thank you. Key and whatever. Peel, peel. All right. I don't like these. Straight up. Don't do them. It makes me mad. And you're saying, well, why are you still in this slide? Because I have to. State of Texas tells us things that we have to teach. Unfortunately, this is one of the things I have to teach. And you're wondering, well, why does why the state of Texas make you teach it if it's terrible? They're not really good. Uh, it, well, let's, let's put it this way. It's really outdated. Okay, that's the best way to put it. It is still used today in many speeches, but in my opinion, it's outdated. Okay? Because how many times... Um, can you really grab attention with something like this? Not that many. And it's a cop-out. It's an absolute cop-out. What people will do is they say, they'll start to be, uh, they'll do a speech on how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. They go, I mean, I made a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. All right, I have. So today I'm going to show you how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Okay? That's why I say it's a cop-out. It's an easy way to complete an introduction. So whenever I say you can go to the bathroom, that's cool, but I don't want you to go get drinks. You didn't know that? So just for next time, okay? Don't go and get beverages. Because the, the, the past very clearly said the restroom. Okay. All right. So does that make sense? Or how many y'all ever, how many y'all as a kid ever had a yo-yo? I never had a yo-yo. My mom never got me one. Today I'm going to show you how to play with the yo-yo. Okay, it's not entertaining at all. It doesn't grab your attention at all. Okay. What you said, who likes peanut butter and jelly? Who likes peanut butter and jelly? What if someone in the class doesn't like peanut butter and jelly? Then you've lost them. You know what I mean? So it, it's, it, it, like, I can see application for it. Heck, I just used a rhetorical question in my last introduction. Okay. How, who, how many of you all want to lose 25 pounds? Okay. Was a good choice? Probably not. But, like, I want you to know that do not cop out on your first speech, okay, by doing, by doing a, uh, by doing an introduction that, um, that has a rhetorical question, because I just hate them. Absolutely hate them. Okay. I'll get mad. I'll throw things. It's not fun. Okay. Um. I don't know why I have a picture of that dog there, but he's just so cute. So, this is one I, I, I think most people prefer is humor. If you can start your speech with a joke or something entertaining, uh, people will be usually interested. That's why people love Ellen DeGeneres because she was funny. right? She started her speech off with some humor, and it worked out really well for her. Okay, People enjoyed that speech. So, humor is oftentimes a very good way to start a speech. Uh, some of the speeches, most of the speeches I'm going to show you here start with humor. So I think they're most effective when it comes to, to being an introduction. Okay. Can you use, like, little parts? Yes, absolutely. All right, that guy slam dunking around the world. Or there's people, by the way. There's people watching. Um, okay, quotations. I am absolutely okay with quotations, but something very important that's not on the slide here is that quotations must, must, Relate to your speech. Now, some of y'all are like Rodriguez. Really? Isn't that obvious? No, not to some people. Okay? For example, many of y'all have a, fam a favorite quote. You may post it on Facebook or, or Twitter or Instagram or Insta Chat, whatever you have you. You may post like, today, do something great for your life because tomorrow may not happen. Some, you know, quotes like that, okay? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. You know, like like football. Football, they probably have a quote of the day today. It's like it's like give 121 percent 
because your opponent's given 120. It's, uh, it's 12, 12, 212. 212. That's right. I, I got the numbers all jumbled. 212. I knew Coach Cope had something he's been throwing out. 212. <laughs> got to give 200. Why 212? Because that's what water water for. Water for. So that 212. Yeah. At 211, you just have hot water and cook the That's some deep thinking right there. So. 212. So, you don't want to kill the grass. You want to take out your opponents. You want to boil their face off. So, um, anyways, you know those. They're everywhere. But look, you wouldn't say that quote to do a speech about yo-yos. Okay? You wouldn't. All right? You may do something like Will Ferrell once said, yo-yos are the most evil object in the world. Okay? And it'd be kind of funny, and you'd go, well, but Will Ferrell's silly. He's just probably mad because he don't know how to do any yo-yo tricks. Like, that could be a funny introduction, all right? And it is actually, it's not a real quote from Will Ferrell, but it probably sounds like it would be, okay? Uh, but you know what I'm saying? Like, you want to make sure that your quote relates. I always get, like, Gandhi once said, Abraham Lincoln once said, Oprah once said, what? What does Oprah have to do with yo-yos? What does Oprah have to do with peanut butter and jelly sandwiches? Oprah, Oprah can buy all the people. I'll buy all the people. Okay? So, does that make sense? All right, I don't want to know about that. All right. Who are we playing foosball today? I don't know. We're not playing today. We're playing tomorrow, right? Right. Why are we playing tomorrow? Uh, because I guess it's two schools. Playing. Oh, they share a stadium? Yeah. You know, it would make sense for us to do the same thing, but we built another stadium in town. Anyways. Okay. Who are the kooks playing tonight? Uh, they said, uh, <laughs> we can't be talking very much. No, but we play hard teams just to get up ready. We play teams that went to state last year. They play like little small schools. Are they playing what, St. Joseph's? Yeah. They are? Joseph's and stuff like that. Yeah, like private school. Like, that's not fair. But we're going to be better than them. Like, that okay. All right. I believe it when I see that W column with a right. one. Jonathan, we got to make that happen tonight. Who, where are they from? Missouri. Where? Missouri City. Oh, Missouri City? Okay. 5A, 4A, 6A? They're 6. They're 6? Yeah. <laughs> I know it doesn't matter. So it's, it's they're 6A? Yeah. Okay. They suck, though. Did y'all win yesterday? No. <laughs> <laughs> hey, fr hey, freshman won. Freshman doing good. Freshman, yeah. Freshman, freshman doing good. Coach Day is doing a good job with them freshmen. All right. They're going to be they're gonna be beasts. All right. So listen. The next is a story, uh, which I kind of – now, okay, I want to make it very clear. A story is not about you, okay? Personal experiences are about you, but stories are not. I'm going to tell you a story all about how my life got flipped, turned upside down. That's a personal experience. That's not a story. <laughs> He's also the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. But if I were to tell you the story about the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, that would be the story. But if I'm the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, it's a personal experience. Does that make sense? I probably confused some of y'all. <laughs> a story, you're telling the story, okay? Uh, but it does not involve you. That's what makes a story because a personal experience is about you. So a story can really interest your audience. Uh, you know, you can start with a story. Uh, you, can, you can start with history, okay? It's probably a good idea too. Because his story. Hey, hey, hey. I was just kidding. You be careful if you say that around. Tell that around my wife, you may have a problem. Say it. No one cares about history. So then we all know personal experiences, right? Personal experiences is what I gave you in my first introduction about the yo yo man. I talked about how I, how I rented a, a video with a guy with a big afro. Okay, it was at my public library. I'll never forget it. My library opened up in town, a brand new library, and this is the biggest deal, guys. You won't believe this. It was a big deal because they had VHSs you can rent. I remember. And it was free, so you could go, to, you could go to the library and check out movies for free, and it was a big deal. And I'd go and check out all the Garfield friends and watch all the Garfield. But I also, I also picked up the Yo-Yo Man. Okay, this is before like Block Blister and everything. Okay, it was like a big deal. <laughs> All right. Where did it? Where did it go? <laughs> red, red box, man. Red box. Right, right, right. Red box killed him. 
I, I thought, you know, if, if Blockbuster only, like, they could have stayed alive if they rented all their movies for a dollar. Yeah. They have so many movies in all their stores, right? All they had to do was rent them all for a dollar because they'd have more selection than the box. You'd take the logo. And that's all they had to do. Because I used to work for Blockbuster, and it was like when, when I was in college. And I was like, you guys got you guys got changed. It was it was four it was at four ninety nine. Yeah, four ninety nine for a movie. For a new release. A dollar ninety nine for the old stuff, like Little Giants. I like that. By the way, Little Giants is playing tonight. Is it tonight? Yeah. Is it tonight or tomorrow? Yeah, no, it's tonight. They're doing it at the at the amphitheater, at the amphitheater. For free at Wolf Pain Creek, you go watch Little Giants. Little Giants, the one with the girl playing football. Yeah, Icebox. Yeah. Icebox, yeah. yeah. I, was, I had that on VHS at my grandma's house. Hey, my sister was looking for that the other day. Okay, last uh, last one. Okay. Reference to occasion, audience, or topic. This is most popular at places like weddings, funerals, funerals. Is that right? You funerals? Okay. <laughs> That's how you spell it, right? Yes. That's terrible. Uh, funerals, uh, gradu graduation speeches. Okay. Uh, these are when you see these. That's really sad. Graduation speeches. Uh, this is where. Okay. You tell them. Uh, you focus your listening attention on what's going on, comma. Why they're there and what why they should be listening to you. Okay. So what you do is you reference. You say you reference the occasion, the audience, or the topic. I am so glad to be your class speaker at this year's graduation. The class of 2015, I applaud you for the great things that you've accomplished here at Annan Consolidated High School. You should be proud of the achievements that you've done so far and of what's coming for you in the future. Okay? All of this would be a reference to occasion on topic. I'm saying congratulations, graduates. Okay? But that's the audience. At your graduation, that's the occasion. I, I haven't said the topic, but you know what I mean. You can reference these things in your speech. That's very popular. You'll see these at weddings, too. Bob, Jane, thanks so much for having me here at your wedding today. It means the world to me. Jane, you've been my friend for, like, ever, girl. Okay? You see that it happens at weddings. Okay? Uh... Funerals, right? You have that thing, you know, dearly beloved, we're here. No, I'm not kidding. Uh, what they say is like, you know, when they do the eulogy, they'll usually say like, thank you, friends and family, for being here today. A very sad day for a loss of our dog, Fluffy. Okay. <laughs> you think I was talking about a person? Yeah. Come on now. You know, uh, before I came here, the teacher who taught this before me had the students do a eulogy of themselves. And if that if that's not the creepiest assignment, I don't know what is. Uh, and, and so you would write your own eulogy, and it's just it's it's creepy to talk about you dying. So I changed that a little bit. So we don't do those speeches, but at funerals you would use this kind of introduction. Well, what what I will tell you is we do. We do a very similar speech in here. The last speech you do is called the last lecture speech. Oh, I like that. Uh, it's a good speech. Oh, like and the last speech is the last speech that you would give your fellow classmates like you're never going to see them again. And you share stories about your life and how they taught you things. So it's kind of like a funeral speech, but not really. And we know everyone cries in here. I cry at least three times. How, how many times did I cry? I don't even want to. Yeah. Oh, I usually cry at the end of the year when those speeches do. Hey. You don't know. Bro, them speeches get emotional. For real? Yes. You do not even Where know. <laughs> like, <laughs> in those speeches, people share things about their lives that you would not even imagine. Yes. She's talking about a grandpa. Yep. Like, oh, it's so sad. It's like, and, and there's no rules. Like, whatever happens in here stays in here. And what I tell my students is that if something is said in here and it's repeated outside this room, I will find them and I will immediately fail them from the entire course. Okay? Because, because look, 
it's it's personal for a lot of people and people are coming up here and they're sharing some very personal stories about their lives and it's not very easy to do that so you know i tell them like look we're not go over here to go and spread rumors we're here to to be together share this time all right and to and to appreciate the stories that our fellow students have shared with us because it, it 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 was a lot to do yes sir oh yeah that's right we're going to do this for half a semester all right. all right the last part is a conclusion now going back to the burger analogy so think about a hamburger right when you grab any hamburger and let me uh, i got a perfect example okay when you grab a hamburger what you need is two buns that are perfectly matched okay i mean they are different colors but they are the same size and then you have the patty, which is my logic book from college. One of my favorite classes, by the way. If you can avoid math and take logic, take logic. It's a lot more fun. All right. So, only for us liberal arts people who go to A&M. All right. So, this is my hamburger, okay? Very similar to what you see on the screen. All right? <laughs> have this for lunch. So, if this is my speech, I have everything right. Okay? But if I'm missing my conclusion it's really hard to eat i mean you can eat a burger like this but it's really messy the whole part of the bottom bun is to hold everything together so you're not touching meat and condiments and lettuce and tomatoes right so what's really important is that they match up right because look if it doesn't match up and you have a smaller bottom bun you can't hold on to it right still you still have a problem right this is why the conclusion is so important. What the conclusion does are these three things. And folks, if you learn nothing today, know that your introduction and conclusion must match. You do the same from the intro here, okay? Whatever you said in your introduction, you're going to repeat those main points again in your conclusion. So at the very end, this is my yoga speech, I'd say, in inclusion today, I showed you three important tricks, uh, basic tricks of how to use yo-yo. First, I showed you this basic sleeper. Then, I showed you how to do around the world. And finally, I showed you my favorite trick, the cat's cradle. Okay? And those three tricks really got me through. Uh, uh, um, um, or those three tricks really helped me uh, to, to master some yo-yo tricks, which I still use today. And I'll never forget the time that I met the uh, yo-yo man going back to where I started from, okay? Then, you repeat the goal, right? Today I showed you how to do this, and then you provide a clear ending. Here, folks, not on the slide, you need to literally re-establish the intro. English sometimes does it, okay? Where you kind of go back and talk about what you talked about in your introduction. So at the very end, I would talk about the Afro Yo-Yo Man, okay, as my last bit of closure. Uh, what I'm going to do on Monday is I'm going to teach you a, a introduction pattern called the Rack and the Tracy model, which I've developed through a couple of years of teaching this course. And uh, I'm going to show you, it's a formula for those people who are like math people. But anyways, I'll leave this up to you. Happy Friday. Thank you for being awesome. And don't forget to be awesome. <laughs> Oh my god!